we have a very special guest today, um, Dr. Lawrence Brown. So can you tell us, just for anyone who's not um, heard of you before, um, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Uh, a little bit about myself. Well, from what I know of you, uh, I've been following you for a long time. Um, you've been quite active in the Dawa over the years. You've written a number of books and uh, helping new Muslims uh, find the religion. In fact, I've benefited a lot from your work uh, when I first came to Islam. Alhamdulillah. Didn't um, know that. Yeah. yeah I didn't know that. Yeah. Really? Yeah. MashaAllah. Um, a lot of your videos and, uh, and lectures. Glad to hear that. I'd like to hear that. Uh, I'd like to think I had some influence on you. Yeah, a lot, a lot Direction. of people, yourself, uh, Dr. Yeah. Bilal Phillips, definitely, back in the day when I first started looking into Islam. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, you know, it was quite a powerful image for me, seeing white Muslims. Because I remember, I, th I thought you had to be, I, yeah, seriously, I thought Islam was like a religion for, yeah, uh, I thought it was a religion for Pakistanis. No, I've heard this before. Yeah, and seeing the likes of you, um, Abdul Rahim Green, Yusuf Estes, yep. other white Muslims, I was like shocked. I was like, you can yeah. actually be a white Muslim. Yeah, yeah. And you can also wear a shirt and pants. Like, you can actually look white. Yeah, believe it or not. <laughs> I, I was, uh, I was uh, shocked. Yeah. These type of things had, a, had an impact on me, actually. Yeah, believe it or not, I mean, it's kind of funny. It's, it's not the first time I've heard that. Mm. I thought putting this on airplane mo mode would be enough, but I guess I'll just oh, turn Lord. it off. Uh, but in case, uh, yeah, it, no, it's, uh, I mean, it's not the first time I've heard that. I remember one brother saying that when he first saw a Caucasian Muslim, it was like, wow, it's, it's allowed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <coughs> I mean, I remember so many examples of this. I remember once inviting um, I was I was friends with uh, a brother in America and uh, he was a uh, he was a black American and uh, and you know he was telling me about this no Muslim and I said well I'll invite him over mm. you know come to my house and we'll have dinner and um, you know when he arrived uh, the uh, my friend who knew me, his name was Abu Bakr. Okay, when Abu Bakr arrived with this brother, it was the other brother who, who came to the door first. Abu Bakr was, I guess, mm -hmm. parking the car or something. He came to the door first. And he also was a, a, a black American. So he rang the doorbell, I answered. And when he, when he saw me, he was like in shock. Mm -hmm. You know? So, you know, it, it was clear, you know, he was like, <coughs> he was like uh, you know, uh, you, you know, you know, uh, um, you, you know, as if it couldn't be me, you know, yeah. in his mind, it couldn't yeah. be. And he, you know, even though he was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he was a black American uh, himself. And, uh, and then it was funny, you know, so when he got over the initial shock and we got comfortable with one another, you know, just things became good. But, it, but the same brother, Abu Bakr, I don't know why, so many funny things happened with this guy. One time I was in my office and he, had, he, he was just dropping by for something. And he dropped by my office mm -hmm. and I had a patient in my chair. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, to this day I remember this patient. And... Uh, in any case, he came in and uh, he sort of interrupted my exam with this patient, which was okay with me. I was expecting him. I just excused myself and said, excuse me, and he asked for something. So, of course, I greeted him with the typical, you know, salam alaikum, wa alaikum salam, blah, 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 yeah. you know. And so my patient, she sees me interacting with this, you know, this black American brother who was obviously Muslim, dressed as a Muslim, but I, I was in the military at the time, so I was, I was mm. dressed in uniform. Of course, in uniform, you, you all look the same, mm. and, and so on. So I gave him what he needed, and then, you know, said, Salaam alaikum, and he left. Mm. And, uh, and she said, Dr. Brown, are you, are you Muslim? And I said, well, yes, alhamdulillah. And she said, but, but, but you can't be Muslim, you're white. <laughs> Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. She said, you can't be Muslim, you're not black. She mm. didn't say you're white. She said, you yeah. can't be Muslim, you're not black. I was like, 
first, you know, first time we went to Bosnia. Same uh, thing? Yeah, sort of? No, basically. Yeah, because they're all... They're all white, yeah. Yeah, they're all... So they have the, the yearly janaza, you know, for the, the um, bodies which they've identified from the massacre. Uh, um, so every uh, year they have this janaza. And so there's literally like 70,000 white Muslims uh, in janaza. Uh, 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 uh. And I was with my Pakistani friend, and I was stood next to him, and I noticed him and said, now you know how it feels. <laughs> 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 I just remember looking around and it was just it was crazy. For me, it was a, an amazing experience because, like, you know, seeing actual, like, white Muslims, you know, not Turkish white, like, Euro, you know, a white European, you know, uh, it, was a, it, was, it was a weird experience. And, and a lot of the time I always, because I travel quite a lot, a lot of people mistake me for, like, Abraham Green and yourself and... I've even had you see fastest, believe it or not. <laughs> wow, they must have been watching some old videos of Yusuf Estes <laughs> to confuse the two of you. Yeah. Have you ever had that yourself? Have you ever been mistaken for uh, I have been mistaken for some yeah. others, but, but you know... There, all there, white people at the same. There, there's this kind of... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, but uh, you know, I think there's this... Uh, yeah. Like you said, all white people look the same. But but <laughs> you know, uh, I th there there are. I mean, you know, <coughs> you know, ten or twenty years ago, we we were yeah. uh, there were far fewer of us than there are now. And uh, you know, it's just a beautiful thing. I mean, uh, I've never seen a religion that just cuts across the races yeah. like Islam. Um, yeah. oh, of course, this was. This was the wake-up point, I think, for Malcolm X. Yeah. You know, it was when he came mm -hmm. to Mecca and Medina, when he came to the holy cities, and he described in, yeah. in his biography how uh, he was praying, praying behind a, uh, you know, a, an Arab imam, and he noticed that there were Caucasians in the congregation. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, he asked the imam, you know, don't you realize that there are some Caucasians in the congregation? And the imam yeah. had, you know, actually... It's like what, huh? You know, and mm -hmm. lo looked around and you know, as it, as if he had never really thought about it, yeah. and, and and said, oh yeah, you know, of course, you know, mm -hmm. and that was very striking to Malcolm X to realize that mm -hmm. that there were people who um, didn't even really think about the mm -hmm. issue of color. Yeah, you know? I remember when I first got his book, I just couldn't wait till the end. I had to skip through it and get to the last chapters of his journey yeah. to uh, the pilgrimage. Yeah, it's very touching. But how about your Muslim, Muslim name? Because, you know, a lot of white reverts, well, a lot of reverts in general, they have changed their name. Yep. You know, and I get I get that a lot, a lot. Even, you know, the other day when we were together. Yeah, yeah. People saying, well, what's your Muslim we're name? pushing you. Yeah. Even, even Arabs asking me and, and really trying to push a name change, you know. And uh, I, was, I was speaking about one of the Tabi'een, uh, George, not many people know about him, but he, uh, he actually accepted Islam on the battlefield in the Battle of Yamuk against the Romans. Mm. Uh, it's mentioned in the Hadith, uh, Jaja. And he, uh, he actually died on the battlefield, a shaheed. He'd never prayed any salah. <laughs> and uh, I, I was playing with the idea of maybe we change the name to George. <laughs> <laughs> From John to George. Yeah. I took an Islamic yeah. name. <laughs> George. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think, you know, the name John, of course, I mean, it strikes a chord in a lot of people's minds because they think, <coughs> they think of the Bible, yeah. Bible, the book of John, the first epistle of John, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So, you know, um, yeah. But, I mean, I, I do have an Islamic name, but I still go by yeah. my westernized name. I my think Western it's good name, for My given Western, name. Yeah. yeah. You know, well, my, my father's John, my grandfather's John. And I think it's a very personal thing as well for, for, for non-Muslim family members. You know, I mean, of course, people have the, the right to change it if they like. There are different ways of looking at it, but mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've always felt that it's important to the Dawah in the West to let the people in the West see that mm -hmm. this religion is livable. It yeah. doesn't impose hardship upon you. Mm -hmm. and. It doesn't, you know, it it doesn't require you to do things that you would not, you know, I mean, feel comfortable with, or or that would make you feel. 
you know, awkward or uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for example, I mean, changing the name, uh, some people would find that they would feel that would be disrespectful to their parents, or they just don't want it, or they're just not ready there yeah. to that. But you know, you know, to to change your name from a Western name to a Muslim name yeah. puts you out there, kind of makes you, you know, puts a spotlight on you in a way that yeah. a lot of people would not want, especially initially. Yeah. They may may come to a point where they say, you know, it's time, yeah. you know, let me yeah. change it. But, uh, but it's certainly not a requirement. So tell us a bit about your books. Why, why did you decide to write so many books? Have you always been an author even before Islam? Uh, no. As a matter of fact, I hated writing. And mm. English was my weakest subject in college. Mm. High school, junior high school, grade school. Yeah, I was terrible at English. Um, so no, I, I, I didn't write before Islam. And uh, I consider it kind of a miracle because uh, I hated writing. I mean, I really hated writing. Uh, I remember that uh, I used to, you know, my grandparents used to send me gifts for my birthday and for the holidays and so on. And my mother used to have to just force me to write a one or a two line thank you note. You know, I just hated writing so much, even though they were sending me like money and things like this. I just hated to write. And, uh, but you know, I think that, uh, I think a lot of reverts and, you know, certainly this is the motivating, you know, the motivating is issue for me. I think a lot of reverts, they get this feeling that they want to do something big. Mm -hmm. They want to do something, you know, really that will count for them in the Akhira and for me uh, I didn't set out to write a bunch of books I only wanted to write one book and uh, how many do you have now? seven, seven okay. but the uh, but the reason why I was because at the time uh, when I became Muslim my uh, first wife she divorced me and she took the, ch the children she had custody of my my two daughters, and um, because of the situation, her living in America, and I was in the military at the time, and I was uh, restationed in England, so that meant that I would get to see my daughter only maybe for two weeks out of the year. My daughter is every for two weeks out of the year, and so um, a lot of the motivation was there were really two main motivating factors. One was that. Uh, I don't know uh, any other way to say this except that I just got tired of talking. Mm. And uh, what that means is that I just noticed that whenever I got into conversations with Christians especially, um, <laughs> it always followed the same issues. I know how you feel. You know, well, yeah, okay, <laughs> so what about the Trinity? <coughs> and you explain. So what about the divinity of Jesus? And then you explain. Mm -hmm. What about the sonship, the alleged sonship, mm -hmm. the alleged divinity of Jesus? And you explain. What about the alleged crucifixion? And you explain. And so, you know, and so you go through, you go through the explanation, uh, and it always seems to follow the same patterns. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, one thing that I just realized is so many of these people, they're not, they're not really inquiring about Islam. They're, they're actually using the dis discussion as a way of trying to make Christian dawah to you, the Muslim. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, I just didn't want to spend my time that way. I did get very tired of answering the same sequence of questions over and over again. That was kind of the minor reason. I wanted to be in a position when those discussions came up of just saying, look, here's my book. It says everything I want to say. If you're really sincere, you'll read it. Mm -hmm. And if you're not really sincere, you know, we'd be wasting time in discussion. So, mm -hmm. so that's really the minor reason. And uh, the major reason was, was something that I can best express just by reference to a movie. Did you ever see The Core? No. The Core was, it was a movie about how Basically, the core of the earth, the, you know, which has a certain uh, circulation, becomes disrupted and stops. And so uh, it 
basically is preceding what would be the end of the earth and the end of humanity as we know it. And uh, so it's this mission where they're sending a team to the center of the earth to basically restart the core of the earth. Okay, mm-hmm. and uh, so they're they're on their way to the core of the earth, and uh, they're a team of scientists, and and two of them are talking, and one of them says to the other, you know, basically you're you're doing this to save the world, but me. And he shows his family two daughters, and he says, I'm I'm doing this just for my two daughters. I'm doing this just to save my two daughters, and. That was, that, was, that was the main reason why I wrote that book, is because what was really in my mind was I was separated from my children. I didn't know when I might leave this earth. And I wanted them to have something so that if and when, if ever, the day came when they started asking themselves, okay, Dad is gone, and now we want to know what he believed and why, so they would have something from me not from somebody else, something yeah. from me to explain. And then it just snowballed. I mean, I finished that book. I felt the need for another. Which, which book this was one. this? That was the first and final commandment. So that was your first? That was the first. Yeah. And that subsequently became divided into misguided and godded, which are... Yeah. The first and final commandment was really large. Yeah. And then I got it professionally edited. I cut the pages, made it more readable, and so on reduced it to two volumes that became misguided and Godded. And um, then this book, Bearing True Witness. And then after that, I started writing novels, Islamic novels, yeah. which was a lot of fun, <laughs> which I really enjoyed. Yeah. But, yeah. If you don't mind me asking, I mean, do you, how is your relationship with your non, non-Muslim children? Have they, have they looked into Islam at all? No, it's good, mm-hmm. uh, and it's gotten better over time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think that there's just certain baggage that follows you, which is it, it's very difficult to um, ever get rid of. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for example, I mean, uh, their their mother divorced me. Um, and it was a no-contest divorce. Basically, we were in New Mexico at the time, and she just decided she wanted out. She was Roman Catholic. I had, um, she had married me against the dictates of her religion and, and her church. Uh, because, you know, Roman Catholic are not allowed to marry an atheist, which is what I was. Yeah. But she, you know, she married me all the same. And then when I became Muslim, we actually reaffirmed vows and married, a, remarried a second time because she was feeling so insecure. But despite all that, um, she uh, <laughs> she divorced me because I didn't want to have statues all over the house. Mm. It's kind of interesting because, Subhanallah, you know, you you think of how devoted some people are to their idols uh, you know I told her I told her look you can have a room in the house that's all yours just make it into a uh, you know make it into your own personal sanctuary if you want to make it you know make it you know I mean you can fill the room with whatever you want to I'll never go in there I just don't want these statues of you know a crucified Jesus a bleeding statues statues of the passion and so on all over the house and I said, so just, you know, put them into one room, and that'll be your room, but leave the house for the rest of us. And, by the way, I'm paying for the house, mm-hmm. so do I not have the right for this? And, uh, and she preferred to divorce me than to remove her statues. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in any case, she, I mean, she went, I remember she went to the court, the judge was a, a, a lady, and... Uh, she, uh, you know, the judge asked her, you know, why do you want a divorce? And she just said, I just want out. And she said, is he abusing you? No. Is he hitting you? No. Is there psychological abuse? No. Then why do you want a divorce? I, you know, just want out. You know, I just want to be divorced. And so the judge put a um, restraining order on me against my wife's 
wishes and without her asking. And um, so, you know, the thing is that being divorced when the children were a young age, around, I think it was around four and five years old, it, it was very traumatic on them because they saw, they saw the, the issue that led to the divorce as being religion. And I think, you know, I think in children's minds, mm. when they see it that way, when they see that mom and dad broke up over, over religion, it just creates kind of a psychological baggage that is really difficult for them to work through over time. Mm-hmm. So having said that, uh, you know, I think that, um, I think time is the great healer and Allah is the one who can open the hearts. And, um, you know, you find this you know, a lot, like, so things are getting better. Yeah. When you say with time as well, it's, you know, you see a lot of new Muslims, you know, they have very difficult times with their family, you know, and when they, when they, when they go in through it, they don't realize that with time it's, it's going to get easier. I remember when I was, I was actually mm-hmm. living with my parents at the time. I didn't tell them I was a Muslim for over a year. And, um, but when they found out, it was, it was difficult. You know, I had to move out and... Uh, really? Yeah. That's and, common in England, but, isn't yeah, it? But, but that was quite easy. It was quite easy for me. But yeah. other new Muslims, um, you know, they have, it, they have it tough. Yeah. You know, and... Um, yeah, they do. Yeah. It's always diff- more difficult when there's children involved as well. Yep. Yeah, I've heard so many stories, but I have been struck yeah. about how in England in particular, there seems to be a l- mm. very low threshold for parents mm. throwing the kids out. Mm. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've been amazed by that, actually. Mm. The, um, you know, the family attachment just doesn't seem to be, be that yeah. strong. And, you know, we were talking a little bit about our tribe, the Caucasian yeah. reverts. You know, one thing I've noticed mm. with interest is that that problem does not seem to exist mm. among other ethnicities. You know, uh, the Hispanics, the blacks, and I've so on. It, they they seem to they seem to maintain their family in, like, integrity. Hindu Indians, are just you know. They, oh, well, that's different. Yeah. I mean, that's that's one of the most hierarchical, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, society or, or, or religions in in the world. You know, and so yeah. that's. I mean, I, I just have to say that's in a class of yeah. its own. Yeah. But you know, I'm talking about, for example, in England, in yeah. America, and so on. You don't seem to see. You don't seem to see that uh, that rift develop. Not in the same yeah. way among the blacks, among the Hispanics, among the yeah. you know ethnic minorities. Yeah. They send. They seem to have more family integrity mm. than yeah. our tribe, so to speak, which seems to be very much more fragile. You know, easily broken. Yeah. Yeah. I think generally family ties. I mean, of course, in in America. You have the, the Christians. They have a strong sense of family within the South. Really? Well, not I always. Say, I would say compared to England, I mean, the, the families are really broken down now. I can't make that comparison. I only lived in England for three mm-hmm. years, but from what I saw, mm-hmm. I, I mean, from the little that I saw, mm-hmm. uh, I would suspect you're right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but just not always. She was telling us that you, you was in the army, the American army. Yep. So, what? When? When was you in the army, and what was you doing? <laughs> uh, I was a doctor. Yeah. Yeah. So. No, it was. You know, I mean, I saw it as a good deal way back when. The it was a deal where the uh, the military. It was a way of getting through medical school, basically. Mm-hmm. The military paid for my medical school. I was uh, I was attending a very expensive medical school, Brown University Medical School, one of the Ivy Leagues, and um, so it was an issue of either uh, going heavily into debt or uh, or this. And uh, so at that time, the military offered this uh, this deal where if you you know if you accepted the package, they would pay your uh, tuition and living expenses for four years, and once you graduated medical school, um, you would apply for deferment to get your training. And when it was all said and done, you would enter the military and pay them back four years of service for the four years of medical school. And uh, 
So I was in the military full-time active duty from 1991 to 1999. And uh, so I was, was non-Muslim for the, I was still atheist for about the first three years of that. And um, then I, I stayed in another year on the contractual agreement mm -hmm. and uh, re-upped for another four years. So I stayed a total of eight years. And um, it was, I mean, it was kind of a sheltered, <coughs> sheltered period because uh, at that time, the first desert storm had finished, okay? So I missed that, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> and um, I left in 1999, which was two years before 9-11. So I left. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I left. Yeah. You know, I left before the you know yeah. Afghanistan, yeah. the second desert storm against Iraq, and yeah. and so on. So I really I was in in a time when America's military was basically quiet, quiescent. You know, but one of the reasons I got out is because um, living as a Muslim in the military. I was getting increasingly uncomfortable and uh, just feeling that it was it was very high, hard to rectify being or to justify being a Muslim in the American military. Now I know that there are there are Shayu who have said it's permissible, mm -hmm. but um, but something happened uh, to make me feel I just can't do this anymore mm -hmm. and. Um, Specifically, what happened is I was working as a doctor. I was always a doctor. I was, you know, in the military, you're always regarded as a soldier first and then a whatever second. But I always regarded myself as a doctor first and a soldier second uh, because I, you know, I never thought, you know, I could I could never imagine that I would be, you know, picking up a gun and, mm -hmm. and fighting against anybody. And as a matter of fact, as doctors in the military, mm -hmm. you, you are not required to, yeah. okay? But, but in any case, um, one day I just had a patient who was a helicopter pilot and uh, this basically just changed my thinking about the subject because uh, we were just chatting, you know? And I said, so what do you do for fun? And he said, oh, I blow things up. And I just kind of laughed. And I said, okay, no, really, I'm serious. What, what, what do you do for fun? And he said, no, I'm serious. I blow things up. I, wow. said, I said, what are you talking about? And he said, he said, you know, he said, I just, there's nothing I enjoy more than, you know, just, just going out and shooting stuff and, you know, blowing stuff up and so on. And I said, what, you mean like, a gun range and so on. And he said, no. he said, yeah, sure, okay. You know, he was like, you know, you, you know. I, but he said, but he said, the, but the best time I have in my life is when I take up my helicopter and just lay waste to an area, just you know, machine gun fire and missiles and this, that, and the other thing, whatever. Uh, you know, I think it is basically machine gun fire and missiles. And I said, you know, I said, you know, well, I mean, aren't you? I mean, if you're in an engagement, I mean, aren't you realize, I mean, you know, there are women and children down there. And he just kind of went, yeah, but it's just so much fun. Well, I realized he was a psychopath. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the military, that kind of person works, yeah. but not with me. And I realized that if we were in a time of war, which we were not, but if we were in a time of war, and I had this kind of person as a patient, I would have to face the responsibility of caring for somebody who is doing somebody something that I just cannot condone. You know, and uh, it kind of it took me back to those, you know, Vietnam War movies where you, you you see guys just you know randomly shooting out of the helicopter at anything that moves because they you know for them this is just you know yeah. target practice on human beings yeah. 
I mean, it's like, did you ever see Full, yeah. Metal, Full Metal Jacket? That yeah. scene where the guy is just shooting, yeah. and he's, you know, ask you how can you how you, can you can you shoot you know women and children? And he just, said, you just don't lead them as much. Yeah. You know, and and saying things like well, you how know, can you get to that stage you unless know, you you know it's totally dehumanizing Muslims or whoever they're you know fighting against. But this is the military. It's just you know the military always dehumanizes the enemy. It always, you know, it's the way of convincing the soldiers, you know, basically, you know, you know, basically like, numbing, numbing yeah. their conscience so that you know they, what's beautiful? you know, I mean, it's probably not the time or the place, but when you do look at the guidance from Islam on these type of things, you know, Islam does humanize the, everyone, you know, in this situation, even when you come, even in terms of chopping trees and things like that. You wouldn't be able to do this uh, if you was in warfare. Yeah. Sure, I mean, you know, things have to be done with conscious women discrimination. And and things like that. Yeah, you're not allowed to kill women yeah. and children. You're not allowed to kill old people. Um, you are, you know, you have to have conscious discrimination in what you yeah. do, and you have to be merciful as much yeah. as the situation allows, and so on. Yeah. Um, and. What I saw in the American military was just this intense, sort of Hollywoodized um, attitude in people, the cowboy attitude, and so on. And I was disturbed by it. And a lot of people, you know, I know that a lot of people in the military looked at me and said, What's wrong with him? Mm. For being kind of soft hearted. And, uh, I mean, I always was. I always was the soft-hearted person, and the. Um, I mean, I remember, before Islam, even before Islam, just as an example. Um, I used to go shooting with a friend of mine, just target practice. Okay, I used to. Be, <coughs> I used to be really, really into guns. I, I mean, I I enjoyed them. I, you know, most Americans are into it. You know, and I remember going to this outdoor shooting range in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I lived at the time. And um, we were just doing target practice downrange, and a little bird came and landed at a certain distance away. And my, my friend just, just said, get him, get him. And I was like, you know, because it, it was a challenge. It's a, a moving target really small, you know, mm. and, um, a, a f you know, it, it was a tough shot, you know, and I, I lined it up, took the shot, the bird just kind of fluttered and died, and um, we went and looked at it, and, and the shot was, it just, you know, had killed the bird instantly, just right through the head. Now that was just a little bird, and that was 19 plus six, I mean, that was about 25, 26 years ago, okay? And I swear, I think about that little bird so, uh, so much, and continue to think about that little bird, and continue to just feel awful about it. And, you know, I remember my friend was just so, wow, look at that shot, that was amazing. You know, so, and he, he wasn't thinking anything about the fact that, you know, a creation of Allah had just died for no reason. Mm. We weren't, we weren't going to eat it, we weren't going to benefit it. But at this point, benefit you were atheist, right? Yeah, I was atheist. So, so you, well, well, you know, well, why was you feeling like this? Like I said, I've always, I was always, I, I may have been atheist, but I was always very uh, soft-hearted. And so I, I think because of that, a lot of people saw me as being uh, just different. Um, you still had yeah. the fitra. The fitra was still, you know, the moral side of the fitra was still active. Yeah, and I think, you know, part of it, you know how our religion teaches that you're born on Fitra, but it's your parents who make you Jewish yeah. or Christian or whatever, you know. Well, my father was also very soft-hearted, and I think it just rubbed off from him. Mm -hmm. Now, he was a researcher, but he was, um, he was very committed to humane 
use of animals. And I remember once walking into a, a researcher, another researcher's office on the other side of the country. He was actually the chairman of the ophthalmology program that I went to, and I saw up on his wall a, a surf certificate that said, you know, something like an honored member of the Monkey's Uncles Club, you know. And I just kind of laughed. And it was obviously something made in jest. Yeah. You know, something about monkey's uncles. And this guy is a member of the monkey's uncles club. And I just laughed and I said, what is that all about? And he said, oh, he said, that's about the humane use of research animals and, you know, treating them with kindness and, and so on. And, and he said, uh, you're not familiar with it? And I said, no. He said, your father started it. Oh. You know, I didn't know that, or you know, something like that, and and uh, and uh, so that was my dad, and so you know, I just I, I always had that kind of respect for life and the feeling for, you know, I, I mean, feeling for even animals. I, I remember when my father taught me to fish. Mm. You know, people don't think about the feelings of fish very much, but my father was you know very concerned about. The fish, so when we caught a fish, we we had to, uh, you know, kill it immediately. Mm. We couldn't let it just suffocate on the well, on the land. was the opposite of this. Uh, he was a slaughterman. <laughs> he was a slaughterman. <laughs> he was a slaughterman. Yeah. Yeah. But he did care for the animals. Um, you know, subhanAllah, he spent a lot of time with animals. He would say that he would never, he said the most fearful thing for an animal is when it's on its own. The most and what? When 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 the animal is alone. Yeah. They they they're very scared. No. Oh, so he would yeah. always have them, you know, in twos or threes, and um, also he, ne uh -huh. he never liked it when I would go fishing. Uh, you know, like game fishing. He was he used to go sea fishing, but he would eat it. Yeah. You know, so he he was he was of the belief that you know what if you catch it you have to eat it. Right. You know you don't waste the fish. You know. Yep. Yep. And, uh, yeah, I was desensitized to killing animals from a very young age. He would take me uh, to work with him sometimes and let me, you know, watch the animals being killed. Um, so I, you know, I was desensitized to animals. Well, that's got to be pretty rough for a kid, but I, yeah. Yeah, but... but, but it, By the way, they know, don't like to do that here. No. No, here in Saudi Arabia, um, you know, actually... Uh, a lot of people have, you know, cautioned mm. against, you know, you, you don't take your children to see the animals slaughtered. I mean, mm. because uh, of just that, you know, I, I guess that and, uh, mm. you know, so on. So how long have you been living in Saudi Arabia? It's been 19 years now. Mm. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, it's been a blessed time. Yeah. It's been a beautiful and a good time. experience. Yeah, it's been wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably, this is everyone's dream to live in <laughs> Medina. Every Muslim's. Uh, yeah. But, uh, but, you know, it's kind of sad that the non-Muslims don't understand. It's... There's so many misconceptions about Saudi Arabia. You know, uh, it's evil place. And everything is upside... My, everything's upside down. My wife just always had that saying. I always yeah. used to say things are upside down. <laughs> I remember when my wife is, uh, you know, we met in Amman, Jordan, and, and married in Amman, Jordan. Mm. And uh, and actually, we, we had an arranged marriage. Yeah. Uh, just kind of a shock to the sensitivities. Yeah, my wife and I met in Amman, Jordan, and uh, we had an arranged marriage, actually. Uh, which is a different story, you know. A Westerner going through an arranged marriage is something uh, truly frightening, mm. you know, because you're not you used to that. You know, I want to clarify to anyone listening that it's not a forced marriage. A lot of people think arranged marriage. Oh, yeah. Marriage is <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. You know, it's synonymous now with, with forced marriages. That's, yeah. that's uh, kind yeah. of... You know, arranged marriages, just to clarify to anyone listening. Yes. Yeah. No, just another one of the misunderstandings, you know. Yeah. My wife could have said no. Um, her entire family, and you know, was very supportive, and uh, 
but she could have said no at a, any moment. Um, but, um, but you know, having had the experience of married once in the traditional manner, mm-hmm. dating and living together and then, then marrying in my days of ignorance, in my <laughs> pre-Islamic days, and then having an arranged marriage mm-hmm. as a Muslim, I would never, never get married any other way. Subhanallah. Uh, subhanallah. You know, they have a saying... They have a saying in the Middle East, they have a saying that, you know, in, in the West, women marry for love. Mm. That, or, the, or they, you know, they marry the man they love. Mm. And in the Middle East, women love the man they marry. Subhanallah. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's, you know, the dynamic is that love develops between the couple who marry with sincere intentions, you know, and... Uh, mm. And uh, so, yeah. It is a very spiritual thing, you know, from an Islamic perspective, in a way. You know, Allah says he puts love between the hearts. You know, he, yeah. you know if you do have that connection with Allah, yeah. of course there's a certain amount of compatibility. And well, you know, you do have to, you know, you do have to, you know, talk to the person. And, you know, you, you can see their face, you can see their hands, you can... You know, hand. It's amazing how much you can learn from a person's hands. Mm. You know, I mean, when when I, you know, when I was told you can see that face in the hands, I was thinking, well, you know, what can you learn from a person's hands? But you know, you can really learn a lot from looking at a person's hands. You can, you know, just look. You know, you can see visually the hands are or soft or hard. You know that. Mm. The fingers are slender or chubby, and uh, you know so on. You you can learn a lot from a, looking at a person's hands, mm-hmm. and uh, and yeah. So certainly, <coughs> you know, you can see enough to just mm-hmm. get an impression of whether this person would be visually appealing to you or or not, and uh, and and so on. But yeah, no. Definitely, my wife could have said no. But so the but the interesting thing was that when we did get married, she came and joined me in England. So we lived in England for two years, and then in America for one year. And for the entire time, I just remember my wife saying over and over again, everything is upside down in the West. Everything is upside down. I have so many stories. I mean, my wife... You know, as far as like dis- dispelling misconceptions, uh, you know, my wife was one of a family of eight children, mm-hmm. and she was the first to drive, of all the children, and she was the only one to have a car, the only one, not the boys, and there were five girls and three boys, she was the only one to have a car. You know, because she was the oldest. It wasn't a matter of, you know, girl versus boy. It was a matter of she was the oldest yeah. and, you know, she was the one who came of age. And when she came of age, she got the car. Mm-hmm. And she was driving. And and, uh, and uh, not only was she the, you know, the first and only to get a car and to be driving, but she was the, uh, the first one to go to college and uh, get a college education and... Uh, you know, become a you know a college graduate and so on, and get a respected job and and so on and no, so forth. Very much me. her own person. You yeah. mentioned this the other day, and it really stuck with me. Subhanallah. You you tell me when you was walking through Oxford uh, with your wife <laughs> past the restaurant. Oh gosh! And this Subhanallah, this really really touched uh, me. Yeah. First of all, it was Cam- Cambridge, not Oxford. Okay. Yeah, Cambridge. But, you know, there were so many stories. That was a, Those were our first years together. And, I mean, I just remember when we were newlyweds, mm-hmm. so many funny things happened. I mean, hilarious things. You know, the, the, British, the British are very interesting people. Uh, they can be quite eccentric at times. And I remember one time we were just walking on the street and she, you know, there was a, a guy going down the street in his bicycle. Mm-hmm. And he had one of those little bicycle trailers behind him attached to the bicycle. And what was in the bicycle trailer? A German shepherd. Okay. And my wife was just looking at this. And by, by this time, we had been in, in England for a while, enough mm-hmm. so that she had seen so many things that just went, you know, flew against the reason of 
you know, what she had grown up with. And she saw this man pulling a dog, you know, where in her country it should be the other way around yeah. or nothing. You know, the dog yeah. should be the dog should be serving the man, not the other way around, you know. She saw this man, you know, pulling a dog and it's kind of like, you know, <laughs> Like I've been saying, everything is upside yeah. down. Yeah. You know, I, one of the funniest moments was we were uh, we lived uh, in a uh, second a second floor apartment, yeah. okay, overlooking a rather busy street. And across the across the uh, street were some pubs and a, a late night um, fish and chips place and so on. And one time we were just in our apartment. And there was a woman across the street who just started yelling and yelling. And my wife's immediate reaction was, you know, my Islamic name is Abdullah. So she was, her immediate reaction was, Abdullah, there's a woman, you know, she's, you know, she's in danger. She, she might be getting hurt, Abdullah. And my immediate reaction, because... I could, I could hear that whatever was happening, this woman was in control. <laughs> you know, and my immediate reaction was just to start laughing, which of course... Well, to see if the man was okay. <laughs> which, yeah, to see if the man's okay. <laughs> but my immediate reaction was to start laughing, which of course made her, you know, concerned. I mean, you know, she thinks, you know, is my husband crazy? You know, and, and so and I just had to... You know, honey, whatever is happening over there, the woman is okay. Trust me. <laughs> so, no, Abdallah, she's yelling. She's screaming. Oh, that, no, that's not screaming. That's yelling. <laughs> and sure enough, you know, we went to the window, and you know, she's uh, just she is just basically tearing into this guy, and she's totally in charge. But but so yeah, the the incident you're talking about was kind of poignant to me because we were newlyweds at the time. Mm -hmm. And we were taking a walk uh, on the streets of Cambridge, and uh, yeah, it was amazing because there are many restaurants there, and they all have these large plate glass windows that allow the people inside to see out, and of course, the people outside to see in. And so we passed restaurant after restaurant after restaurant, and my wife keep, kept looking in in a very curious way, looking at all of these people eating, you know, at the tables and. And uh, after three or four of these places, she asked, uh, Abdullah, what, what are these people doing? And, you know, of course, of course there are restaurants in Amman. Mm. Um, but, you know, in general, they're in the hotels mm. or they're very modest affairs and, uh, and so on, or at least back then they were. And uh, or they're touristy, you know. Um, Amman is more developed now, but I'm talking about 20 some years ago. Mm. So I guess she said, Abdullah, what are these people doing? And I said, Well, they're they're having dinner. And um, then, I mean, I really didn't feel like I didn't really feel like that. And with my first wife, it's we didn't do anything else. Mm. We always ate fast food and ate out and so on. My first wife barely cooked. And uh, so here I was remarried with a, a wife who, you know, was cooking and taking care of me and feeding me well and so on. Yeah. And I really didn't want, I didn't want to go there to eat. And, you know, also to navigate halal haram food yeah. and so on and so forth. I just didn't want to do it. But I saw my wife, you know, looking and I, I didn't want to disappoint her. So I said, so... Uh, <laughs> Would you like to go have dinner, you know, in one of these restaurants? And, and she said, no. <laughs> and, and she looked at me and she said, Abdullah, don't these people have families? SubhanAllah. And, you know, and because, I mean, it's just a beautiful thing to her, to her eating, you know, eating dinner, eating, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't about the food. It was about the family. It was about the social experience. Yeah. And... You know, we as Westerners are raised to believe that this is the high life. Yeah. You know, you want to live the high this life. Is what you, you want to go. To, basically. Yeah, exactly. This is the, you know you, this is the sign of success and so on. To her, this was like the sign of, of failure. This yeah. these are destitute people yeah. who don't have you know you feel this, families you know, to share the experience when, with. When you go to a Muslim country, you know Morocco, Egypt, or wherever it may be. Yeah. 
you really do feel this sense of family. You know, even as a tourist or a traveller, they invite you into their home, they'll give you the food, they'll, you know, they're very hospitable. And this is, this is how, this is the, the yeah. culture of Islam. And Could they take, know. they take pride mm -hmm. in hosting people. And family. Yeah. And yeah. yeah but it's, it is sad when you look at it, and it's embarrassing, really. You know, and by the way, um, you know, cultures worldwide are becoming westernized. So yeah. you have to understand that you go there now, especially as a tourist, you find the tourist experience. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, you know, the time-honored value of Muslims, especially of the Arabs, you know, so among the time-honored values are uh, hospi hospitality mm -hmm. and honesty and generosity. You know, and uh, among the Arabs in particular, people people used to basically compete with one another on these things. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, they used to have a saying to be as generous as Hatim. You know, Hatim was a, an example in actually in the pre-Islamic days of a man who was just extremely generous. Mm -hmm. You know, so to be as generous as Hatim was, you know, sort of a catchphrase. Mm -hmm. But you know, the, I mean, the Arabs used to compete in these, in these virtues. And in the West, I mean, these virtues are practically lost. You know, honesty. Mm -hmm. Honesty. I, I mean, one of the things that is really striking to me is just the level of moral decay in the West. Mm -hmm. You know, you find people who will just lie for a dollar or for a very smaller amount of money, you know, mm. and you see this all the time. You know, a lot you, of people, you know, a lot yeah, of people we, listening. You see it all the time. A lot of, no, wait, wait, um, a, lot of, a lot of people listening will object to this and say, no, I'm basically mm. an honest person and mm. so on and so forth. But if you really think about it, if you really think about it, you know, how many people will tell these little white lies, a oh, white lie is a lie. Yeah. Okay, or, or something to protect their job, or what, you know, somebody accuses them of something yeah. on the job that they really did do, and they'll just lie about it, but, you know, to protect their position or their salary or their income or whatever. And uh, what did you say? But but you living outside of the West for such a long time. I mean, I've I've been out, so I've not lived in the UK for nearly three years now. And when you go back into England, in uh, into the West, you actually realise how how dangerous it is. You know, when I was actually living there, you just become immune to the society. You become immune to all the dangers. You know, in England, we've got a big problem with, with in the Muslim communities as well. You know, because they're generally in the, the poorer communities. You know, knife crime, gun crime, drugs, you know, this type of thing. And if you want to live in a, in a non-Muslim community, your children will be raised with, you know, without religion. And it's, it's not until you step out of the society and then come back, it really hits you. I mean, when you say dangerous, are, are, you, are you talking about physical danger? Or both, are you talking about religious, physical, spiritual physical danger? and spirituality as well. Yeah. You know, there is a threat. I mean, London, I think there's 30 stabbings a week. You know, and, and a large proportion of them are going to be Muslim kids because it's the Muslims who are living in, in, these, in these areas. Yeah. You know, drugs, you know, abortions from Muslim sisters and, yeah. you know, this type of thing. And, and not only that, you've got the theological attack as well and the danger of that. You know, I, I recently did a tour of the UK and got Syrians who are recent refugees that, and telling me that their children are saying they want to be Christian and uh, Somali sisters saying that they become atheists, they don't believe anymore. This is, you know, this is a worrying thing, and they, they, they're, good, they're from good families, you know. And Did I ever tell you why I came to Saudi Arabia? No. Uh, <laughs> you didn't tell me why you actually became a Muslim as well. Well, let's start with why I came to Saudi Arabia, yeah. uh, but you might find this interesting, uh, because... Just say, excuse me, I have a cold, so I'm a bit... <laughs> yeah, that's okay. But, uh, yeah... You know, as I told you, I was in the military, mm -hmm. and uh, I had married what is now my second wife, and uh, I had made the decision to get out of the military because I just, you know, I just did not feel that that uh, I could work within the military and, and feel good about myself. 
And uh, so I had made this decision, and now I'm an ophthalmologist. I was an ophthalmologist in the military, and so I, I had good opportunities outside. And um, the, you know, financially, the opportunities in America were much better than the opportunities overseas. But then... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No. yeah. I mean, even... Oh, no, even until this day. I mean, ophthalmologists mm. do well for themselves. Uh, but the Yeah, mm. yeah. I don't know how it is in England. But, uh, sure. uh, but in any case, you know, I mean, in general, doctors, uh, you know, doctors make a decent living. Mm. At, least, at least in my profession, ophthalmology. I mean, there are, there are fields of medicine that, you know, maybe are not as, uh, as lucrative. But in any case, that all aside, the thing was that um, I, uh, I just came upon an advertisement looking for an ophthalmologist here in the Middle East by the group that I did join, which is called Magrabi. And, um, and in any case, uh, so I had, uh, I had interviewed for the position, and I was considering that uh, compared with the other opportunities I had in the States, which were much more lucrative. And it was not an easy decision at the time. And, and I was thinking about it back and forth with, with, you know, talking with my wife, considering the, you know, the advantages of coming to a Muslim country versus the advantages of staying in America and making more money and so on and so forth. Well, right about that time, there was um, a couple in our area. Uh, they, ha they were both doctors. Um, and both wildly successful. They were work, working in private practice, and they drove new Mercedes Benzes every year, his and her Mercedes Benzes. Mm -hmm. They lived in a, a very, uh, very huge, beautiful <coughs> sort of, you know, trophy home. And um, I mean, they had all the trappings of high financial success in the West. And right about their t that time, their daughter turned 18, the age of majority in the States. Mm -hmm. And the moment she turned 18, she went to her parents and said, I want to live my life. Mm -hmm. She took off her hijab. She said, I want a boyfriend. I want an apartment. I want to live as I want to live. I'm out of here. And she did it. She had left the home. She took off her hijab. She started living in the Western style. She started living in Zina with a boyfriend in an apartment, going clubbing, going drinking, and, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, the best part of that was that she was drinking alcohol and dancing, you know, the, and living in Zina. The, the worst part of it was that she left the religion. Mm -hmm. And her mother was just you know, psychologically destroyed, and she, uh, she couldn't work. She uh, basically collapsed in her, in her home, and just, she just stayed at home crying, 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 and just saying over and over again, I would give everything for my daughter. I'd give everything to have my daughter back. And it was their only child. Mm -hmm. And my wife and my our reactions were basically, you sold your daughter into the dunya a long time ago. You know, and then we looked at our situation. We had one daughter who was one year old. And we just said, you know what, it just that makes our decision a whole lot easier. And uh, so that's, that's why I accepted the position here in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And the rewards of living in Saudi Arabia and in Medina in specific just are difficult to count. Mm. You, you, you realize how unimportant money really is. When you look back, just the, the blessings of living in Saudi Arabia and Medina in particular <coughs> uh, just far outweighed uh, any financial benefit, any additional financial benefit I think I could have earned for myself in the West. Mm. But you know, you, uh, we, we got onto this line of, of thought uh, talking about basically the dangers in the West and yeah. I 
think a lot of people live sort of in self-inflicted delusion. You know, they um, they don't really realize on a day-to-day basis uh, how much risk they're putting themselves in. And uh, it's scary, sure. It is. I mean, but you know, I don't. I don't feel it so much where where I live. You know how it is in America. It's just um, a lot of crime is concentrated in inner city and uh, you know particular areas. But it is all over, and it can happen anywhere. And uh, we got psychological yeah. dangers as well. Oh, well, that's something different. Uh, I mean, I mean, that's of course the greatest danger. And what you know, what you're talking about about how so many people lose their children. I think there's a spiritual aspect to this because, um, I mean, I've just noticed that. At, I don't know how it is in England, but I've noticed in America. The vast majority of Muslims treat the mosque as basically a social center, not really as a place of worship. Yeah, you know, they go there and pray, but it's more a place to sort of keep in touch with other Muslims. Mm. And uh, the vast majority of Muslims um, just are not the best examples of Islam. Mm. And I think what's really going on is that um, you know the kind of Muslim, the kind of if you if you can use the term ethnic Muslim, I don't really like that term, but you know as a descriptor meaning Muslims who are born and raised in Islam in foreign countries who then come to the West, they're usually coming for dunya reasons. They're usually coming for education or money, jobs, you know, yeah. and to you know t- to make money and. Um, they're basically making hijra mm. from a land of Muslims mm. to a land of dunya. Mm. And if that is your motivation, I mean, do you really expect that to be rewarded? And so, so is it really so much of a surprise that their priority is upon the dunya mm. and what they will neglect, of course, is their children and their families? And is it really any surprise that... Um, you know, their mm. their families drift away, and mm. you know, in many cases, grow up not even knowing what Islam is. Yeah. Uh, it's it's sad. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I was in Kuwait for two years, and like, the most general thing the children have done is like watch a movie. <laughs> you know, they, they were so innocent, and children yeah. of the same age group in the UK were, were like they had gangs and a drug a drug ring, and uh, you know it's. You know, like, subhanAllah, like, totally different experience. Of course, Kuwait has its troubles. You know, it's a, you know, there is some children who have doubts, etc. But it's nowhere near on the level of what the average Muslim is going through in the West. Yeah, no, it, it happens here in the Middle East in general, but like you said, nowhere near as much. And, uh, uh, you know, but let me give you a story which will, I think, sort of bring things home for a lot of the audience, okay? Uh, My wife is Palestinian. She was born and raised in Kuwait. Mm. And then uh, during Desert Storm, uh, their their family moved to uh, Amman, Jordan, okay? And then she completed her, you know, life in the Middle East until she met me in in, uh, Jordan. Now, she was the oldest of her family, and um, when I met her, she thought Mickey Mouse was Arabic, an Arabic creation, you know, yeah. because she had always seen these things on TV in Arabic. Mm-hmm. And one time we were talking about the innocence of, you know, children raised in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. And because she was the oldest in the family, she had raised a lot of her brothers and sisters or, you know, helped with their raising. Mm. Which, by the way, is something else that, you know, it's an amazing thing to see how tight the families are in the Middle East. You know, they, they take care of one another and they nurture one another. Whereas in the West, yeah. you know, if you, if you take the oldest... <coughs> the extended families as well. It's not just the immediate family. 
Yeah, but but yeah. you know, in general, like you know, if you take the oldest mm-hmm. boy or girl in the family and mm-hmm. say, you know, help raise your brother or sister, they see that as an imposition. They see that as you know a problem, a weight upon them, a restraint upon their happiness. Mm-hmm. You know, whereas here it's normal and they enjoy it, and you see them yeah. nurturing one another and playing with one another. But in any case, back to the innocence issue, she told me that uh, up until adulthood. You know, adulthood. Um, she she remembered how her youngest sister, you know, even as she grew up in through into her teen years, when she would see on the television Tom and Jerry, and you know how Tom will see the female cat, mm-hmm. and his eyes would rrr, 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 and you you know his eyes would sort of bug out, you know, and then his heart would sort of pop out of yeah, his yeah. chest and you see this big red heart, you know, yeah, popping out, yeah. this big red heart, you know, yeah. popping out of his chest. He said that when her youngest sister, you know, who, who's named Heba, <coughs> when, when Heba would see this, she would turn away from the television blushing. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. That was the level of innocence of these, you know, just the beautiful the level of innocence of... Yeah, just a beautiful level of innocence of the fitra of the people of this wow. area. Wow. Now, okay, you compare that with, you know, take a, take a, even a, a nine or a ten-year-old mm. in America, and the study the studies show that the, you know, the average child in America by the time they're nine or ten have been exposed through the internet to hardcore pornography not Sorry. not just you know not just nudity but hardcore pornography Sorry. where is the innocence anymore yeah. and if you're losing your innocence mm. if you're losing your visual and your mental and your spiritual innocence at that age what is you know what's the chance for you as you grow up it's terrible it's, it's frightening yeah it's, it, it is frightening Sheikh I think we'll have to leave it there for today it's been an interesting uh, podcast as well. And hopefully, inshallah, As we always. can uh, do something else in the future, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. So, jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum.